Oh, you mean all couples? vacation together? Oh, I, I think that's no. very much an issue. I see that all the time, where families go on family vacations together and two spouses not married to each other begin to flirt with each other and tease with each other and become too familiar with each other and they get themselves in trouble. Mm. I think also this idea that you spend many times with these friends more alone time than you do with your spouse. It's very easy to do, Moira. It just... Someone it, at the workplace? Exactly. It, maybe you sing on the same worship team. Well, you're mm. with them alone more than you were with your spouse. You know, if you're working out in the gym three days a week, you're more alone time there than you are with, you have with your spouse. So it's very easy to get into a rut where you're spending more time with this friend than you are with your spouse. Is this a higher risk for women because we're relational? Well, I'm not sure about that. I, I think it's pretty high risk for guys. They, they can begin to like this other person very easily especially if things aren't going so great at home. Or maybe if they're just overwhelmed. You know, you throw in, especially when you're a young man and you got all these responsibilities, you got little babies, you got shortage of money, you got a wife who's wrapped up in the kids, you know, or all kinds. It's very easy to love the affection, normal, natural affection and attention that somebody else pays to you. And as we'll probably see more in discussion later in the week, um, the freedom from responsibility. This yeah. connection mm -hmm. is... Oh, it's, it's artificial. Just all fun. I, exactly. <laughs> and it hasn't even gotten bad yet. That's the point mm -hmm. to remember. It's still a normal situation that happens in everyday life. But you haven't gone through the, the crucible yet, where all the pressures really begin to mount and kind of sweep you off your feet. So here's the clincher, though. You know you're in trouble if you and your spouse are fighting over this friendship. If your spouse says to you, I think she's hitting on you. You know, I think, he's, I think he likes you. And if you say, oh no, they're just friends. You need to listen to your spouse because your spouse is intuitively picking up on signals. And we often, us guys especially, we have a tendency to discount that. Oh, she's not flirting. Well, women know flirts. <laughs> <laughs> they just do. So I can't argue with that. So you have to pay attention to what you and your spouse are saying to each other. But here is how, this is usually the final straw, and I often fish for this. I mean, I'm trying to find if this actually happened in many couples that come in to see me. Did this person touch you innocently on the shoulder, maybe put their hand on your hand, and you had an emotionally charged reaction inside you? Mm, look out. Okay. If you did, you're that close, okay? So, if people put an arm on your shoulder or pat your hand and nothing happens inside, that's probably a pretty good indication. It's still just a friendship that could go somewhere. But if you have an emotional reaction on the inside, an emotional shiver, an emotional rush, then you're in hot water. This is where the Bible would say flee. A run, baby run. Flee yep, temptation. I mean, that would be a signal of oh, impending disaster. Yeah, but that is so titillating to the individual who experiences it. They say to themselves, I can manage this. This won't get out of hand, you know. It, it's fine. It's just pleasurable. Well, what happens next is you begin to milk, if, if I can use that word, or manage the friendship to nurture yourself. Mm -hmm. And so when you get down or discouraged, or you feel frustrated, you go see that person. You call them, you text them. And it brings that rush of feeling back. And it's an amazing experience, this self-nurturing process that happens in these kind of friendships. Uh, you talked about stressors, and you list three that, that brought into this seemingly harmless uh, connecting pretty much guarantees. Oh yeah. Uh, and, and some of them are surprising, pregnancy. Yeah. <clears throat> Pregnancy is a big risk factor. On the research team I was on in the 90s, uh, we found that 50% of all the pastoral infidelities that were identified by the pastors while in ministry and married, 50% of them occurred when their wives were either pregnant or had just delivered. So the pregnancy and the first year of the baby's life are huge uh, issues. Husband's not getting well, the attention. Well, just think about it. Here's a mom, a, a woman is pregnant, she's tired, she's, her hormones are changing, her emotional focus is changing, uh, she's preparing for this baby, sometimes there's restrictions, bed rest is re required. Um, 
then she has the baby and the hormones change again and then she's nursing and she's sleep deprived and you it just goes on and on and on, you know? So... What are some other combustibles? Mm. High risk. Well, let's take personal ones, okay? Ones you maybe bring to your, uh, the table yourself. We do know that among pastors, one of the big ones is if they have a learning disability or attention deficit disorder. Now, as you begin to think about it, uh, it makes sense because many times those children uh, don't have real pleasant growing up experiences. People are always correcting them. They're always telling them what to do. They're always restricting them. They're always scolding them. And so you throw that into the mix along with poor impulse control mm -hmm. and you have a huge need for nurturance. And so when these guys get into high risk experiences where they're feeling neglected or pressured, it's very tough for them to say no if somebody comes along. Mm, that's a surprising one. <clears throat> Um, there's at least one more that I know would be considered a high risk factor. Well, probably the biggest one initially I tell everybody to, to do is check in your family tree. Adultery runs in family trees. Mm. Why? We're not really sure, but it does. And it's one of the first things that we give as, as an assignment in recovery. Go back and find out what your own parents did. Were they involved in something like this? Oh, that's not the kind of thing you talk to your parents about <laughs> normally. So it's tough. Might open up some things. Well, that... but you know, it begins to remove this terrible stigma of what you've done. Okay. Um, and you feel so alone and isolated in recovery processes. And suddenly you realize, you know, this has happened for three, four generations in my family. I knew nothing about it. And it actually creates a greater resolve to protect your own children. And the way you're going to do that is to teach your children specifically how to protect themselves versus just trying to cover it up like all the previous generations did. And sure enough, it shows its ugly head. Secrecy. It comes up in, in both of your books. Secrecy yeah. is a deadly thing. And one of the biggest surprises is that if you're feeling tempted, if you have a friendship that um, is camping in any one or a number of these 19 points mm. of a close call friendship, uh -huh. you should talk to your spouse about oh, it. Talk about yes. a potential combustion. Yes, hang on, hang Scary. on. Scary. Yeah, I know, I know. Now, this is why in my premarital training, I have 44 individuals right now in a premarital class. Okay. And in that class, I will teach them about the close call contract. And in that, I will tell them that you need to talk about this ahead of time because it is going to happen. You just can't not work with men and women, play with men and women, join hobby and interest with men and women. You just can't do this and not have some attractions. If you do, you're, you're, you're sick, okay? If you say you can go through that. You're just gonna have normal attractions and that's what the whole purpose of the contract is, is to normalize this. A close call contract that you make with, with your, your husband spouse. or no, wife? Yeah, with your spouse, your right. Your spouse. Right. And, and basically, let me just read some of this stuff that I have in this close call contract. <clears throat> First of all, you acknowledge that we live in this kind of a culture where we both are going to have these kinds of attractions. It's normal to feel attracted to others. Very normal. Okay? These attractions can be cultivated secretly if they're not shared with each other. Mm. Okay? That's real important. So then, as a result, each spouse promises to divulge the attraction when it begins to surface, to listen if you think someone is attracted to me. That's huge. We just talked about that. So if you think someone's attracted to me and you tell me that, I promise to listen to you. I also promise to listen with respect if you share an attraction that you're having towards someone. I did promise to discuss openly and honestly so we can draw from this attraction and build into our marriage some additional protection so that you don't have to struggle with it. I also promise to work together with you to adjust this relationship to where it becomes as satisfying, emotionally satisfying as possible. Probably means more time invested. It probably does. It pro but on the other hand, it, it can also mean maybe more excitement in the marriage. Maybe it's too predictable. Maybe it's kind of dull right now. Maybe we haven't done things that we know we need to do. We, maybe we stop doing what we do best. Those kinds of things. You know, just on that point, uh, this, this is not new news. Uh, specific to Canada, but a global issue. Um, the 27-year itch. Mm. Couples calling it quits. 
uh, 50 and up. Yeah. You know, they've yep. done all this time together. Yeah. But just the point you've made, boredom, yeah. an unfulfillment yeah. is probably the biggest issue. Oh, it is.